Hi, my name is John Kitchens, and I'm a retina specialist at Retina Associates of Kentucky. And I'll tell you, one of the best parts of uh, my job is actually learning about new data and uh, going to meetings where you get to see your friends and colleagues and mentors. Um, that's, that's great, and in-person meetings are amazing, but there is a great meeting that is virtual every year. Uh, it always occurs the first weekend in February, and uh, it's been going on for just about 20 years now. It's called Angiogenesis. Uh, it's put on by Phil Rosenfeld. It's run through the Baskin Palmer Eye Institute in Miami, Florida, where I trained as a fellow and chief resident. And, uh, and this meeting has just grown and grown and grown. And a few years ago, at the beginning of the pandemic, Dr. Rosenfeld decided to make it a purely virtual meeting. And this meeting has some of the highest yield information that you can get. And it's really placed at a unique time, uh, being in early February when there's not a lot of meetings going on and, and uh, not a lot of information that's being generated out there. And it's, it's really become a mainstay for new data to be presented and data to be summarized and whatnot. Uh, this year's meeting was all on a Saturday. Previously, it had been on a Friday and a Saturday. Being on a Saturday, you could tune in and for a $100 registration fee, watch the presentations live um, and see feedback from the presenters and panelists and whatnot. And uh, I love the fact that they moved it to a Saturday. It was a marathon session. It started at 8 a.m. and ended just before 10 p.m. Uh, but it was a fantastic meeting this year. And I would encourage you, if you're a retina specialist, no matter where you're at, um, internationally or within the U.S., tune into this meeting, pay the $100 registration fee, tune into Angiogenesis and watch this meeting because it is some of the highest yield information um, we can have. And I just want to recap some of the things that I heard, some of the things that I thought were really interesting and unique. Um, the first session that started out was on OCT and imaging. Uh, and uh, a lot of talks about uh, IRORA and CRORA, which are variations on early geographic atrophy and more advanced geographic atrophy, things that could increase the risk uh, on our imaging of uh, uh, and could predict patients developing atrophy. Um, it seems like just about anything, uh, pigment in the retina, you know, reticular pseudodrusin in the retina, um, drusen in the retina, all, uh, GA, all of these things can predict progression. Uh, and so I think we're still really um, needing more clarity in things and ways, perhaps with AI, that could actually help guide us in knowing who the patients are that are going to benefit the most from geographic atrophy therapy. Pearl in this session that I just love is the fact that OCTA, OCT angiography, will actually be paid in the United States as a separate billing code in 2025. Um, this will be the first time that we've had a new imaging billing code that's gonna get reimbursed. You cannot do it and OCT uh, and get paid for both on the same visit, but there will be a separate OCTA uh, imaging code. And the general consensus seemed to be that OCTA would be the image, preferred imaging modality to evaluate the retina in general. Um, and so it was really great, you know, early one. And then we had some emerging therapies for non-exudative AMD. And in this uh, uh, section, a couple of interesting things. Uh, probably the most interesting was the Light Sight 3 uh, trial, which was uh, photobiomodulation and age related macular degeneration. And in this study, it's a device that actually shines light into the eye of a certain wavelength, and it's thought to increase the metabolism of the retina. I'm putting this in very simple terms. And what was so interesting is, is that in these patients that did not have geographic atrophy upon entry and did not have wet macular degeneration, they actually showed improved visual acuity out to the 24-month uh, 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 data point uh, compared to the controls, and less of those patients develop geographic atrophy. So um, this is a device, not a drug, and so it's very likely going to get approved in the next six months and will be available. And I think it's something that we're going to have to figure out how it's going to fit into our workflow or if it's something that's better uh, for an optometric uh, marketplace where they're going to see more patients with that earlier and intermediate dry AMD. And then we get the patients that have progressed onto the more advanced AMD that would benefit from injections for geographic atrophy or for wet macular degeneration. 
Uh, good talk by Alan Ho on cell therapy. Uh, very early studies showing cell therapy. Jury's still out. We participated in a, a cell therapy study with uh, Janssen years ago, and it was a very interesting study. Unique delivery method, the supracroidal subretinal delivery method, which I really like. It's a very elegant method. It looks like it's a method that is really trying to find a uh, therapy to match up. It's as elegant as it is in its uh, in its delivery. And then we moved on to uh, visual function testing and complement in inhibition for the treatment of GA. A lot of talks about microperimetry. Now microperimetry is like a miniature visual field in the back of the eye. It tests the, tests the sensitivity of the retina and various ways that we can test microperimetry uh, to give us better sensitivity in patients who are getting geographic atrophy therapies so that we can ascertain which therapies are working at an earlier stage. So really good data as far as that, that goes. A lot being made there. And then a really interesting back and forth. You know, as uh, right now in the United States, we have two FDA-approved treatments for geographic atrophy, uh, Sifovri and Isorve. And, uh, and we as a, as a collective group of specialists are really trying to figure out which of these two drugs is, is more appropriate for our patients, which is more efficacious. So some comparative studies, some cross trial comparisons, which should always be taken with a huge grain of salt uh, when you do any kind of cross-trial comparison, some more data. And, uh, and the one take-home seems to be that, that visual acuity, which by the way, in all of these studies, there's been shown no difference in visual acuity outcomes, uh, at least at two years in the Isovary studies uh, and at two years in the Sifovri studies while they were compared. Um, directly to a, uh, a match control group that was not receiving therapy. No visual acuity benefit, but there are some things like preservation of RPE and photoreceptors that may indicate that there will be some benefit down the road. We, the jury's just still out, and we are still really looking for which patients would benefit the most from some of these geographic atrophy uh, therapies. Um, a lot of information on those two drugs. Uh, some real world experience with complement inhibition and an up update from Andre Witkin, who's with the REST committee, that's the ASRS committee that looks at uh, adverse events from drugs. And it still looks like the rates of inflammation after Sifovri or Pixetocopalin injections are about one in 10,000 and still no cases have occurred beyond the first injection. Um, so that's reassuring. Great update from Matthew McCumber on the Retina Consultants of America experience with inflammation after the use of peg Pegcetacoplin as well. And then we got into emerging therapies for exudative AMD. Um, and some great presentations there, some very early phase uh, stuff. Um, looking at uh, Kodiak Biosciences has a um, has a uh, bispecific um, conjugated anti-VEGF and anti-IL-6 antibody um, that uh, is similar to their KSI-301 as far as how it's conjugated to a biopolymer, but it binds IL-6 and has an anti-VEGF. And so the hope is, is that there's greater durability. Um, think about this in patients with diabetic macular edema and diabetic retinopathy. David Eichenbaum gave an update on Regenex 314, which is a gene therapy uh, trial. I'll tell you, I'm not a believer in gene therapy for exudative age-related macular degeneration. The, uh, you know, I always worry when I see a waterfall plot where you show how many injections a patient before they entered into the trial received and then how many they got after they were treated. Keep in mind that when you see that plot, those patients before they got in the trial were being treated by just their retina specialist. There was no criteria used for determining their treatment. And so they might have been a specialist that had people on a very aggressive treatment regimen before they entered into the trial. So I, I think the jury in my mind is still very out as far as gene therapy for neovascular age-related macular degeneration. I think there's a lot of obstacles there. And then uh, Charlie Wyckoff and Carl Rogillo gave two great talks on um, a, um, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that is a, in a um, extended release implant. And this is a vol 
Voralinib um, and two identical studies as far as results were concerned are fairly identical for wet age-related macular degeneration. The real key here is to try and extend out dosing intervals, and it looks like this may be quite helpful. Um, and then we got into uh, some of our uh, retinal vascular disease uh, studies and, and probably the hit of the day as far as data that's uh, that it was released at this meeting was the 72-week results on retinal vein occlusion-related macular edema being treated with verisimab. And uh, Ramin uh, Tadioni, who's a really great guy, um, international retina specialist, presented this data. And what was key in these studies is, is the patients were treated monthly for six months. But then after the six months and for the next year, basically, those they were treated on an as-needed basis. And well over 50% of patients in both the Balton and the Camino, the BRVO and CRVO studies, um, could go three months or longer in between their injections. This is the first time we've seen in a clinical trial um, this kind of extended durability. And so I think that really raises furisumab up on the level um, as far as how which drug we choose for our patients with retinal vascular occlusions and clearly indicates something that's uh, that's special and important about this drug. Um, we had uh, some OCT imaging studies. Dave Brown gave a great study on why patients require frequent injections. And I won't get into the specifics, but you know, I think our concept has always been that patients who require more frequent injections have more aggressive disease. And while sometimes we do see that, we don't always see that. Some of these patients, they just seem like they have recurrent fluid that comes back very early after their treatment. And Dave's uh, point was is that the half-life for drugs is variable in patients. And if you look at the studies that establish the half-life for a flibercept, which is reported to be on average 9 to 11 days, uh, I do see that in most of our patients, seems like. But there were some patients in there that have very short half-lives, including one that was three and a half days. So this is really important because as we start to move into higher dose therapies like a flibercept uh, 8 milligrams, um, if you have a patient that, that has a half-life of that drug of three and a half days, that of flibercept 8 milligrams, which is basically going to give that patient two more half-lives, um, it may only last a week or 10 days longer for that patient beyond the two milligrams of a flibercept. So this gives me a lot of hope actually in port delivery system with Susvimo um, that these patients might not need a higher concentration to suppress their, their blood vessel growth, but what they might actually need is a slow and controlled release, something that keeps them from metabolizing or eliminating the drug from their eyes so rapidly. And, um, and it looks like we're starting to see that. I can tell you that in my one patient that's not in the study that received a Susvimo, she was receiving injections of a Flibercept almost every month. And with the Susvimo now, she's been able to go out six and seven months. And I didn't really know if we could count on that to control our frequent flyers. But if this is an answer to our frequent flyer patients, um, I think that it means that Susfimo has a is a very viable option for a significant portion of our patients that we see very frequently and that receive monthly injections. And that could be upwards of 5% of our treatment population. And then we really finished uh, with uh, diabetic retinopathy. And Really a lot of great talks on diabetic retinopathies, um, uh, some new drugs in the pipeline, uh, an update on port delivery system for, um, for diabetic retinopathy, and Dante Paramici gave a great talk on the septum dislodgement and how they really kind of move forward on that and solve that issue. Um, so all in all, a really fantastic meeting. I would encourage you if you're a retina specialist, or an optometrist or ophthalmologist that has a lot of interest in where retina is, um, what the current state of the art is, uh, and what the future is for retina to definitely next year uh, pay in advance. You cannot register the day of the talk. You have to register at least um, a day prior to the talk, and I would register a few weeks early. Angiogenesis 2025 through the Baskin Palmer Institute. Can't miss virtual meeting that is fantastic. 
Want to do more talking head stuff like this? If you guys like it, give a thumbs up. I've turned off the comments because I don't have time to respond to questions from patients and other things such as that. Uh, but please feel free to leave a like if you like this kind of stuff. Uh, if not, go ahead and leave a dislike. I'm not doing this to make money. I'm doing this because I really enjoy and love what we do and love talking about it. Thanks for watching.